So Shabbat Shalom everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Most welcome. Uh, this week we're in Baha Pahu Chatai. And Tommy, if you would do us the privilege, please, brother, to tell us Baha Pahu Chatai in the Hebrew, please, man. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Because there's, there's quite something quite beautiful which, which led me to bring this forth this week. Because when we were in work, you asked me if I'd read the Parsha. Yeah. And I said, uh, yeah, I sort of know where I'm going with it. And you sort of came out with... Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now I remember what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I, when I, once again, see, we're on a double pass, yeah. And once again, it's um, it's 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 God's uh, way of speaking to us, and and this Baha. It uh, means in the mount or at the mount or on the mount. And it's on about Sinai, so it's Baha Sinai, and then the next day, pass, yeah, which is doubled up with it, is Bahukatai in my statutes. I was saying to Joe, said it's it's basically um, when you have Yeshua the same on the Mount, it's like it's like Sinai part two. Mm -hmm. Basically, it's Sinai part two. Because here now we have um, it, it, the, 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 the law, the, the, the statutes, the, the, the Torah basically. Because whether it's a, a, a Chukot or the Mespetim, or the adult, all different types of laws and statutes and commands, etc. It's all the Torah. It's all the Torah. So here we have on the Mount the Torah being given out. You know, and um, we were referring to it when we were together during the week, and I said, Yeshua, when he delivers that sermon on the Mount, this is like this is like part two, basically. You know, it's it's practically the same thing. It's practically the same thing, but Yeshua takes it to an um, an inner level. Mm. Where people were dealing with it to the letter and to the surface, etc., and on outers, on an exterior um, level. Yeshua, people in the Bible say, Well, no, everything's all right now. Jesus has come along and just done away with everything. It's all easy now. Well, no, he, he showed you how, how deep this goes. Mm -hmm. and, it, and if anything, he hasn't made it more difficult. He's revealed how, how deep it really is. Mm -hmm. Which in effect makes it more difficult, because <laughs> like Joe said at the outset, it, it truly is a matter of the heart. This is the inner self here now that uh, Yeshua is touching and probing. You know, it's um, yeah. So this uh, and it's no, it's no coincidence either that this Pasha is the it coincides with the uh, the jubilee where Yeshua comes back at the, the sound of the shofar to release to free up the people, the captives, etc. Yeah, that's just, um, yeah, so that's what we spoke about, and it's, it's whenever I see this Behar, Behukatai, I just think of that same on the mount, basically. Hallelujah. Well, you're in, uh, you're in for a treat, Tommy, lad. Yeah, willing. Thanks. You're in for a treat. Thanks. And this is how our partial begins, Leviticus 25, verse 1. And the Lord spoke to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them. And in Matthew 5, verse 1, Seeing the multitude, he went up the mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Do we see the similarities towards this? So this week, beloved, we are going to do a Torah masterclass by Rabbi Yeshua. A Torah masterclass by Rabbi Yeshua. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Now the Beatitudes translates as the blessings, or you mentioned the blessings by extension in happiness. Yeah, well the Beatitudes... The attitude means blessings, but when Yeshua says, "Blessed are the those that mourn," for example, or "Blessed are the peacemakers," for example, where it's translated as "blessed," it's actually "ashrei," which means happy. Mm, beautiful. Yeah, it means happy. Happy are those. Happy are they. Hallelujah. Thank you, brother. So before we get into this, I'm going to just give you a little bit of a setup, a bit of a synopsis before we get into the Sermon on the Mount. And I felt that this was paramount to deliver, to reveal the full Hebraic identity of Rabbi Yeshua. So before we start this sermon, it's super important that I highlight something that's been hidden for our eye, from our eyes for many centuries. Unbeknown to most, Christianity has become veiled from the full truth of the gospel message. Believers have been deceived by a systematic history that's been impregnated from Rome, papal Rome. And the Hebraic roots of our faith have been viciously severed over many generations. These perpetual changes of the words have inherently 
being bombarded upon believers. Through religious systems and man-made theologies and doctrines of men, the truth has been purposefully manipulated and distorted. Virtually every mainstream Christian denomination has fallen prey to the papacy in one way or another. The vast majority of Christians have been duped by a diluted doctrine of the Italica Ecclesia, or the Italian Church, as it translates. Many are unaware that the doctrines that they've married themselves to and the theologies that they've committed themselves to follow are in fact prepositions of Rome set up with a purpose to lead believers away from the God of Israel and the commandments of the Most High. The doctrines of Christianity, though many denominational subsections, are in fact all under the same umbrella of Papal Rome. Each denomination borrows something or other from the papacy and upon close inspection one can conclude that the theologies or religious denominations that are in the world are in fact manufactured products of the Latin church. This is what we're going to come to understand. And this is the balamic octopus as I like to call it. One can consider how each denomination is in fact another tentacle of the Latinus vigorous Romanus or the Italian speaking vicar. Bear in mind that Rome actually was the enemy of Israel for centuries. They were the enemy of God's people for, for a long time. They um, ransacked the temple. They destroyed God's house. They destroyed the land. They enslaved the people. They forced vigorous taxes and harsh labor upon the people. They crucified the Maccabees. Any rebellion was squandered and squashed. People's families were just butchered. They put bl blood of swine on the most in the most holy place. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this was the enemy of Israel. And now this enemy of Israel has its tentacles into the covenant people. And it's delivering a theology and a doctrine that has come down from a single point, which is the beast. So the very enemy and occupying force of Israel for centuries has its tentacles stretched it out to infiltrate the Kahal of Israel. And this is why many denominations in the world are having an identity crisis. They believe that this new product called the church, when the Book of Acts tells us the church began in the wilderness at Sinai with Moses, it's not a New Testament concept. The Kahal are the called out believers, the ones that follow the covenant, the ones that follow Yeshua. Christianity as a whole has become inebriated by the scarlet whore who dresses in purple and scarlet. And we read this in the book of Revelations that she gets the nations drunk on the wine the wine of false doctrine, false bravado and confusion. That's what we're dealing with here. Those that have drunk from the cup of Rome have in turn yielded to its doctrinal influences of the cup of mixture. What does she say? What does she have written on her head? Mystery Babylon, the scarlet whore. What does this mean? Babylon means mixture. Babylon means confusion. Babylon means what we see in the world. These pagan heathen religions that have synchronized themselves with the God of Israel, with the Bible, with the word of the Most High. The Lord doesn't want that. In fact, he tells us to come out of here, my people. Come out of here, lest ye receive of her plague and partake in her sins. We're called to come out of all religious man-made systems and focus solely on the word of God. We're called to put away the doctrines of men and the theologies of men. And please note, the whore and the Balamic tentacles of uh, the papacy, everyone who set up a new religion was probably a massive move of God at first. You know, you read about how people died and there was these great moves of God, but then what happens is the octopus gets its tentacles in and then they su supply funding and covenants and, and land. They even start providing the curriculum. So if you want to be part of that church, you have to go and train under the order of the papacy. The Jesuits were like the 007. They were like the James Bonds of, of religion and they were infiltrating all the religions. They were infiltrating all the religions. And this one is for you to study yourself, but I think that it's important that I show how a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And once we eat of the bread of Rome, we can become defiled by it. And why do I wanna say this? I wanna show you that there's been a newly found religion, one that our forefathers did not know of. I often think, what would the prophets think if they come back now and checked out Catholicism? They'd be like rolling in the graves. They'd be like, come away from that madness. Come away from that madness. And that's what we're here to do today. We're here to expose this stuff with the light. So we do not fall prey to the trappings of the devil. What does the word say? That we should know. We should know and be understood. That we should mark down, as Paul says, those with false doctrine. Yeah, go ahead, brother. Yeah, as, as a friend of ours says, sadly, largely, the sort of Reformation is essentially reformed Catholicism. Yeah. Mm. Mm. But at first... 
started out as a great move of God, a great revival, a great move of God. And this is what the enemy has been seeking to do in Daniel 7. We've, we've preached on this in the past. Jack delivered something great about the prophecy of the beast in Daniel 7 that comes to change the law of God, the times and the seasons, to dumbfound the saints for a time and a dividing of time. So why have I presented this with you? I've presented this because what we've been found with is we have been given this theology that uh, Jesus Christ came to do away with the law of God, that he came to do away with the law of God, when really the law of God is beautiful, perfect, uh, and true, as Paul describes. It is the perfect word of God, word, word of God. The law, the law of God is perfect, as David says. Read Psalm 119. We don't need to go into all the minutiae of this today. We're all in here for the purpose because we know that his law is true and still ap applicable for today. But the thing that got Israel divorced was breaking the law. That's what got Israel divorced. Mm -hmm. Yeshua comes and dies so that God can remarry us again. And now the enemy still wants to say the wedding vows, they're not there anymore, they're not there. But I've set this up to you today because I desire to shed light on it. Because our Messiah did not come to destroy the law and the prophets. Neither did he loosen the law nor put it aside as some would believe, but he rather taught it and fully preached it in its intended format. Many people, and I've heard them do it, me and Jack have spoke with many different pastors from different congregations, and they actually used the Sermon on the Mount to show how Yeshua either broke the law, added to the law, gave us a new law, reinstated the law, revamped the law, reignited, whatever you want to say, either added or took away from it, either broke it, or he added and gave us something new. They will point to the Sermon on the Mount to do that. But upon further inspection, this couldn't be further from the truth. Yeshua magnified the law, as Tommy said. He drove it inwardly. He drove it inwardly. He refined the law, not redefined. He refined the law. It was man and his theologies and his doctrines that had got it all tangled up. Yeah. The same can be said today with the law of God. And that's why the rabbi came and fully preached it. Do not think I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. So with that set up, I just felt it was important because we're going to see something here that the Sermon on the Mount is actually a Torah masterclass by Yeshua. And before we begin on the screen is chapters 5, 6 and 7 in the Sermon on the Mount. And I've highlighted five crucial statements in this text above that spread right throughout chapters 5, 6 and 7 that signify one thing that the Torah of God still stands and that Yeshua used the words of Moses as the backbone of his ministry, as the backbone of his ministry. In fact, he had to mention five times the law, five times he made law confirming statements throughout his sermon so that his people didn't get confused and think that he was speaking about lawlessness. Here's these five statements that he makes in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5, 17, do not think I have come to destroy the law and the prophets till heaven and earth pass away. One jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law. Matthew 5, 19, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5, verse 20, for assuredly I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. And then finally in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And I shall say to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you work at a lawlessness. There's five crucial statements that Yeshua is revealing to all his listeners that he didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets, that in fact he fully preached it. He fully preached it. And I think that it's really important to make note of these five statements that they are all law confirming statements, they're all law confirming statements. But people will point to the Sermon on the Mount as if he nullified the Torah, that he broke the Torah, that he added to the Torah, that he gave us a new Torah. So he had to tell Israel five times. When the rabbi says something once, you better take heed. Moses said, the prophet that comes after me, you better listen to him. So if Yeshua says something once, you better listen to him. If Yeshua says something twice, I better take heed. My man sp spoke this five times. Five times he, he, he told us. But people will still have the audacity to use the Sermon on the Mount to try and nullify the Torah. But it's far from the truth as we were going to see. So let's break these down. Let's break these down because I believe the Sermon on the Mount 
is Yeshua's masterpiece. It's his masterpiece. And he is a rabbi, he's a Jew. He's, the, he's a Jew who was a rabbi who used the Torah Tanakh to preach the word of God. Remember, Yeshua didn't have Peter's epistle, Jude, John the Revelator, Paul's letters. He didn't have none of that. He had the Torah Tanakh when his ministry was forged. And that's what he used, the Torah Tanakh. Matthew 5, verse 19. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Another translation for this renders whoever relaxes and instructs men to loosen. This isn't about breaking the commandments. We know what breaking the commandments is. Breaking the commandments is breaking faith and that is transgression of the law. This is related to loosening or making light of a matter. Yeshua wouldn't preach lawlessness. Mm. This in Hebrew idiomatic language is to loosen or make light of the least of the commandments. Therefore, Yeshua is amplifying that the least commandments matter in proportion to the kingdom of heaven. Notice how he relates the least of the commandments are in proportion to the kingdom of heaven. I mean, directly already, straight off the cuff there, Yeshua is telling us that the commandments, even the most minimal, are related to the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 5 verse 18, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Following his previous uh, verse, uh, he gives a stern rhetoric here from commanding the people. Using Deuteronomy 4.4, which says you shall not add to the Torah nor take away from it. So Yeshua, not only is he prophetically speaking that one jot or one tittle will by no means pass from the law. He's also reinstituting the Torah there and quoting a Torah commandment, which says you shall not add nor take away from the law of God. He says not one jot or tittle will by any means pass from the law. That's the least of a pen stroke, a comma, an explanation mark maybe in our, in our language. Well, in Hebrew, it's the... The jot is here, the letter Yod, which is the letter. And the tittle is just the smallest stroke of the, the pen. Beautiful. On any letter. Wrong. And last time I checked, heaven and earth were still very much here. Yeah. We're all here on earth today. The Lord of God is here for us today. Till heaven and earth pass away. Not one jot or, or tittle will by any means pass from the law. Matthew 5 verse 20. <laughs> Our master goes on to say, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, who were doing the law, by the way, the scribes and the Pharisees were doing the law. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, who tied your cumin and mint, yet neglect the weightier matters of the Torah. What they weren't doing was the weightier matters of the Torah. But however, righteousness can still be found. Even in the scribes, they have a portion of righteousness allotted to them. Listen, your righteousness must exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, who were doing the law of God. They were doing the law of God. Well, our righteousness has to exceed that. Our righteousness has to exceed that, the weightier matters of the Torah. And Yeshua ends his address by foretelling everyone in a conclusion. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of the Father shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Right, so they know his name is Adonai, Adonai. They've prophesied in his name, so they've got spiritual gifts. They've cast out demons in his name, so they've got spiritual authority. And they've done many wonders in his name. So they're moving in the prophetic. Yet I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. This is a problematic bombshell. Everyone says the Torah is tough and convicting. Look at that. That's deep, that's so deep. This is how Yeshua concludes his statement. It's, it's deep, it's powerful, and it's heart-piercing and heart-wrenching and gut-wrenching. And at this point, once you've read all these, you need to be like, wow, I need your grace, oh Lord. I need your grace, I'm a failure. You see, the Torah is designed to show us that we are a sinner and we need liberating from our sin. We need redeeming and we need a ransom. We need atonement. And that's what the cross of Calvary is. So we read the words of Moses. We're dead. We're condemned by the letter of the law. And through the Lord's spirit, we receive his grace and we are free from the penalties and the curse of the law. And that is the gospel message. But shall we sin now we've been given grace? God forbid. This is what Paul tells us. What then should we continue on in our sins now that we have faith? God forbid. 
God forbid. So profoundly explicit was the Messiah's message on the law and the Sermon on the Mount that the final verse in Matthew 7, the ending of the Sermon on the Mount, it tells us when he'd finished these sayings, the people were astonished at his teaching. They were astonished at his teaching. Now, we use this word quite common and flippant now you, someone could be astonished that a dog run across the road or someone took a free kick from the halfway line but this word in the greek it's explacio which means to be out of mind these people were out of mind it's related to being sent in another direction being literally in another dimension through ascension and amazement they literally had their heads blew off when they heard matthew <laughs> sermon on the mount they literally just had their heads blew off and why was this? The, vex, the next verse tells us, for he taught them as one having authority and not as their teachers of the law, not as their teachers of the law, because he came and he taught the Lord in the Sermon on the Mount, but not in the way that they were saying it. This is why he said, you have heard it said. The law of God was written and inscribed on scrolls. It was written on stone tablets. It was written down. He says, you have heard it said by them of old, because this was the oral understanding of the Torah. This was man's dogma and man's stigma and man's theologies and man's doctrines. This is why Yeshua came and rebuked it. He came and rebuked it. He told them with one having authority, not as their teachers of the law. Now this word in the Greek for authority is exousia, exousia. And it means to have regal authority as though wearing a crown. He's the king of the Jews and he came with a law because he is a king and all the people that serve the king shall keep the king's laws and legislations. He is the king and he came with regal authority, not as their teachers of the law. Keep that one in mind. So with that, we will begin the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5 verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. This got me thinking about Baha Bahuchatai on the mount in my instructions. We see a cryptic glimpse of the Torah there because Yeshua is on the mountain and he opens his mouth to give the statutes. We could actually name this Herman on the mount Baha Bahuchatai. And the first verse alludes to that. He's on the mountain given his mitzvah, given his instructions, he's teaching them. And we even get a cryptic message that relates to Exodus. Check this out. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on the mountain. This relates directly to when the multitudes came out of Egypt and the multitudes went to Mount Sinai. And Deuteronomy 5.4 tells us the Lord talked to Moses face to face on the mountain. Look at the similarities. The multitudes are around. He's on the mountain. He yeah. opens his mouth to speak with them. The Lord is there face to face with them. It's the same sketch. It's the same sketch. Now, even before a word is spoken in the sermon, the word of God sets this up like Baha Bahuchatai. It correlates the sermon to even that of the Torah and when it was given. As the same picture is drew for us, this should symbolize the synchronicity of both events together. It says that he taught them. This is interesting. The Bible tells us that there is one teacher, the Ruach HaKadosh. Yeshua was in the spirit of God and he was teaching the people with the Ruach HaKadosh. This is a prophecy that comes from Isaiah 54 verse 13. It speaks about how the Lord shall teach the children of Israel. And all your children shall be taught by the Lord and great shall be the peace of your children. Isn't that incredible? This also is a confirmation that Yeshua is Yehovah. He was the one who taught the children of Israel. And it's a prophetic message about the Lord teaching the children of Israel. Even Yeshua confirms, you call me teacher and Lord, and you say, well, for so I am. Look at the prophecy in Isaiah 54, verse 13. All your children shall be taught by the Lord, and great shall be the peace of your children. Notice the word shalom shall be upon you. 
This was the authority and the peace that Yeshua gave to his disciples in John 14, 27. Peace I leave you with, my peace I give you. It's a prophetic message, all fulfilling, all unraveling and all unfolding in the tapestry of the Most High. And the word is alive and we should all view this and just have la la these confirmations to really empower us and strengthen us in our walk and build us in hope and expectation for he is so wonderful. The Bible says in Psalm 119, great peace of them that love thy law, nothing shall offend them. A lot of people say like, oh, you know, we need to, we need to pray, pray for peace. And I'm like, Yeshua's give us peace. Shalom, I leave you with. It's been given to you already. Great peace of them that love thy law. In the world, people are out there trying to find peace. They're trying to find peace. Do you think that uh, peace will be at a music festival or at a concert or a beach in Tanzania? Great peace of them that love thy law, nothing shall offend thee. That's what the Bible says. Great peace of them that, have, that love, love, love his law. The Sermon on the Mount tells us when he was seated. When he was seated. Now, in the first century, a rabbi sitting down was equivalent to a pastor setting up and standing in the pulpit. The phrase, he sat and taught, appears common in rabbinic literature. And this, of course, is related to the tradition that the rabbis had for when the Lord appeared to Abraham when he was sitting, when he was seated, when he was seated. He was sitting down. Listen, Genesis 18 verse one, and the Lord appeared to Abraham as he was sitting in the tent door at the heat of the day. To sit down uh, is, a, is a Hebrew idiom for sit at my right hand while I make the enemies a footstool for your feet. And above the Ark of the Covenant, it was the mercy seat. It's to do with Shabbaton, to, to be rested for the finished work of God. Yeshua even confirms this in Matthew 8, 11. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and the west and shall sit down with Abraham. Isn't that incredible? And Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. I can't wait for that day. That's a sure, sure reality that. Think about it. We're going to sit round and Abraham's going to be there. And Isaac's going to be there. And Jacob's going to be there. And Paul's going to be there. Someone's like, hey, Moses is doing a Torah class there with Yeshua. Should we go and lift it up? <laughs> yeah, man, we're going, you know. Hey, Paul's doing a bit of preaching there. Come ahead. Someone be like, David's got the sons of Korah. Let's go and see them. <laughs> go see the sons of Korah, you know. Again, when Yeshua said these words, where did he get that from? Was he making it up? No, he wasn't making it up. It was a prophecy in Isaiah 49, verse 12. Surely these shall come from afar. Look from the north and from the west. This is what it's about. It's about being scattered to the four corners, but being reconciled and brought back together in Yeshua to sit down with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Yeshua was seated. Psalm 47, verse 8. God reigns over the nations. God is seated on his holy throne. Malachi 3, 3. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver. When Yeshua sat down and delivered the Sermon on the Mount, he truly was a refiner and a purifier of silver. The Sermon is going to penetrate you, it's going to pull all the dross out of us, and it's going to refine us completely. And this idea of the Lord being a refiner is found right throughout the Scriptures, but it's related to being sat and refining us, and we are to sit and receive also. So let's begin. We haven't even started yet. <laughs> Matthew 5 verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When Yeshua spoke and said, blessed are the poor in spirit, what did he mean? In the Hebrew, the word is ani, and it means poor, afflicted, and humble. Many people uh, misunderstand this and think that it's to do with finances or being in poverty, which it's not because it's poor in spirit. It's not poor in your bank accounts. You can have money in your bank and still be any in spirit, you can still be afflicted and made low and poor in spirit. This is Hebrew idiomatic language, meaning you are to be afflicted, to be made low, to be to be a, a person of sorrows, not sad of not sad because you've lost your phone charger. You're a man of sorrows or a woman of sorrows for the things that are taking place on the earth. You you're called to approach every situation like you're the poorest man on the earth. Blessed are them who are made low, who are afflicted, who are poor in spirit, who are contrite. That's the perfect sacrifice to God. 
those who are broken and of a contrite heart. So when Yeshua said this, where did he get it from? When he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven, was he making it up? Isaiah 66 verse 2, has not my hand made all these things? And so they came into being, declares the Lord. This is the one that I will bless, Baruch, he who was humble and contrite in spirit, who trembles at my word. When Yeshua said this, he was plucking it straight out of the Torah Tanakh. Remember what Jesus said, my words are not my own, but him that sent me. No word I speak on my own authority, but from the authority that the Father has given me in heaven. All the things that I say have been said by my Father. These are the words of Yeshua. So when he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, every first century Israelite has gone straight to Isaiah 66, them who are contrite, who are afflicted in spirit. He said, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Again, where did he get this from? Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has appointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound up, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all those who mourn. When he said this, he was plucking it straight out of the Torah Tanakh. Go ahead, brother. Yeah, there's a, I, I love that because there's a beautiful prophecy in Zephaniah and um, I brought it up in last week's Torah portion and it says, I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly. Or I can say, I will gather those who will sorrow over the appointed feasts. Who are among you to whom its reproach is a burden? So it's speaking of the exile and, and the sorrow mm -hmm. of that. Um, and, and those who return to his feasts. They, Hallelujah. They, they, they is, they, there's, there's a beautiful time here, but there's also like a, a, a weighty time and a, a sorrow of it because yeah. of what we experience Amen. in the world. Amen. And this relates to Jubilees, of course, which is in our Parsha. Mm -hmm. Yeshua, when he spoke this verse in Isaiah in the synagogue, it was most likely a Jubilee. Go ahead, bro. Um, those who mourn, I don't think it's necessarily intent for those who are mourning the son who's just passed on necessarily although I could do also but I think those who inwardly groan at the the darkness out yeah. there and the way this, this, this state of the world Amen. as Paul states you know Amen. Amen. Yeshua then goes on to say Matthew 5 5 blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth we're on a roll here did he make this up Psalm 37 verse 11 but the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace when Yeshua said this, every first century Israelite, he's going straight to the Torah Tanakh, Torah Tanakh, Torah Tanakh, Torah Tanakh. Matthew 5 verse 6, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. And this is plucked from Psalm 107 verse 9, For he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Isn't this incredible? Yeshua is just delivering a Torah Tanakh masterclass on Sermon on the Mount. And we think that he's made all this stuff up. He's magnifying the Torah. He's refining the Torah. He's untangling the mess of man. And he's reinstituting it and making it penetrate our heart. He's taking the letter of the law and applying it in spirit and truth. Again, blessed are those who are hungry and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. This is also a prophecy in Isaiah 55. Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come and buy and eat. Wow. Yes, come and buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourself in the rich food. Incline your ear and come to me and hear. When Yeshua said these words, everybody was understanding these prophecies that are coming true. Matthew 5 verse 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Was he making this up? Did Yeshua just think, yeah, that sounds good, I'll throw that one in there. No. Psalm 18 verse 25, he knew it sounded good, it was the words of the Lord. <laughs> With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. With the blameless man, you show yourself blameless. Isn't that incredible? Yeshua says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. He's quoting directly Psalm 18, David. With the merciful, you show yourself merciful. Isn't that incredible? He plucked it straight from the first writings. Matthew 5, verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Psalm 24, 4-5. Who may ascend 
the holy hill of the Lord, who may stand in his holy place, he who has clean hands and a pure heart. Blessed are them with a pure heart, for they shall see God. You shall stand in his holy hill. You shall be in his holy place. You shall see God. He wasn't making this up. Everything that he spoke was from the Torah to Nak. Matthew 5 verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Now, when Yeshua said this, it didn't necessarily, necessarily mean about them that live in peace. Of course, we live in peace and shalom. But this is a peacemaker. This is someone who is actively participating in creating an environment, a harmonic reality of peace. You're a peacemaker. There's a bit more to it. You're actually a pioneer. You're not a rebel. You're a pioneer. You're a pioneer to create peace and have a harmony of peace. Now, there is many people in the Bible who are called the son of God. Jacob was called the son of God. Israel is named my firstborn son, my son, the son of God. Solomon is called the son of God. And what we're going to understand is all of these people were actually peacemakers when they were called the son of God. Solomon actually means peace. It means peace. Jacob was the first active peacemaker. He made peace with his brother. He made peace with Laban, Abimelech. He was a peacemaker and he was called the son of God. Isn't that incredible? Yeshua said in Matthew 5, 10 to 12, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake, for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Acts 7.52 tells us, Of which of the prophets have your forefathers not persecuted? All of the prophets that came before Yeshua were persecuted for righteousness' sake. Even the author of Hebrews tells us, and the prophets, some were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they may obtain a better resurrection. Still others had trials of mocking, scourgings, chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, sawn in two. They were tempted. They were slain by the sword. They wandered around in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, persecuted and tormented of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and dens and in caves of the earth. So when Yeshua said, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, everyone, listen, is going straight to the prophets that were persecuted beforehand. Yeshua even said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I have desired to gather you as a chick gathers its hens under his wings. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how thou stonest the prophets that have been sent before thee. All of the prophets were stoned and persecuted for righteousness' sake. And what is righteousness in accordance with the scripture? Psalm 119172, for your commandments are righteousness. When Yeshua said, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Every first century Jew is thinking back to the Torah Tanakh. And here's just a few. This is to just name a few on the screen. <coughs> Moses, David, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, Elijah, Elisha, Amos, Zechariah, Uriah, Hosea. They were persecuted, embarrassed, struck down, stoned, mocked, beaten. They were fugitives, exiles. They were sawn in half. It just goes on and on and on. And everyone would have knew that all the prophets before Yeshua, they were all persecuted for righteousness' sake. For what? For preaching the commandments, for doing the commandments of God. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your Torah is the truth. That's what David said. Isn't that incredible? Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely. Again, what is the example of this in the Torah? Who was blessed when someone tried to curse Israel? How did Israel become blessed when someone wicked tried to revile them and curse them. It's, no, it's none other than Balaam. Balaam was atop of the high place and he tried to revile and curse Israel and say all manner, manner of things against Israel. But what happened? The Lord flipped it round and he couldn't do nothing but bless them. Yeshua was saying, blessed are you when anyone tries to come and curse you. I will bless them that bless you and I will curse them that curse you. This is not a New Testament concept. Yeshua was <coughs> plucking it straight from the Torah to Nach. Nehemiah 13 verse 2, they hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. Blessed are you when they revile you and say all evil things against you. You're blessed. Sometimes people say bad things to me or about me. And at first, like proper, like blows me head off. And I'm like dead offended by it. And then I'm like, 
nah, nah, this is going to be a blessing, man. I need to rejoice in this. And I'm like, do you want a receipt for that, what you've just said? Because you've just locked in some fine Baruch to me, you know. You've just put some blessing on my plate there tonight. And then I think, maybe I should just go around with a target on me back to so I'm blessed all the time, you get me? Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all manner of things against you. I mean, we need to live into that more often, don't we? Because we can become so easily offended, Israel. I've seen it, I've seen it, Israel get offended. But you're blessed, you're blessed when you get reviled, you know. You're blessed when you're persecuted and when anyone says anything evil about you, you're blessed, mate. You're blessed. So in future, when someone locks into them slanderous things, you better say, hey, listen, wow, you've just blessed me. You've just blessed me. Rejoice and be glad. Yeshua went on to say in uh, verse 13 in Sermon on the Mount, you are salt of the earth, but if salt loses its flavor, how can it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. When Yeshua said this, was he going on about like, kitchen table salt on your table no he was plucking this straight from the Torah again Leviticus 2 verse 13 you shall not allow the salt of your covenant of your God to be lacking from any of your grain offerings with all your offerings you shall offer salt salt married any of the offerings of worship in the tabernacle to God all the offerings of grain had to be seasoned with salt Yeshua was then saying you are that offering unto the Lord you are the salt of the earth. You are that salt in the Leviticus tabernacle, which was a type and shadow of all of you who I beseech ye, brethren, by the mercies of God, present your bodies as living sacrifices, which is your reasonable service. Yeshua was for telling us that ye are the salt of the offering, that you are one offering being uplifted to God, that you are the salt of the earth. And if you lose your seasoning, you're good for nothing but to be thrown out. You are that very salt in Leviticus. The salt of the covenant shall not be lacking in any of your offerings. Paul tells us, let your words be seasoned with salt. Paul tells us that we are a living sacrifice, that we need to present our bodies on the altar to be that living sacrifice, which is our reasonable service. When Yeshua said then in Matthew 5 verse 14, in the next verse, you are the light of the world. Was he going on about a light bulb? A city upon a hill that cannot be hidden. Nor do you light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand. And it gives light to all who are in the house. Is he going on about a lampstand from Ikea? Or is he going on about the menorah, the Ruach HaKadosh, the light of the world? What's he going on about here? When he said, you are the light of the world, where did he get this from? Isaiah 49, verse 6. Indeed, he says... It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also give you as a light to the Gentiles. And whilst this is alluding to the embodiment of Yeshua, those who operate in the spirit of God likewise are also the light of the world. This was Israel's original objective. When Yeshua said you are a light of the world, he was going straight back to the Tanakh where Israel are prescribed to be a light to the nations. That's our job, to be royal priests, to be a light, to reflect his light unto the world. Notice here how he says, nor did they light a lamp and put it on the basket, but on a lampstand. <laughs> when he said the lampstand, he's not going on about an Ikea lampstand. He's going on about the menorah, Leviticus 24, verse 4. This is the lamps and the lampstand. He shall be in charge of the lamps on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord continually. What is the city upon the hill? Is that Birkenhead? No, that's Jerusalem. <laughs> what is the house? It's, is it your house? No, it's the house of God. Every first century Jew knows this. You're the light of the world. Isaiah, the prophecy about being a light of the nations. The lamp on a lampstand, the menorah. The light of the world about having the Ruach HaKadosh within us to present to before the world. What about the house to all who are in the house? It's the house of Jacob. It's the house of God. This is what he was speaking about. Then he moves on, do not think I have come to destroy the Lord and the prophet. I said, listen, after all that, now Yeshua says, don't think I've come to destroy the Lord and the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fulfill, to fully preach. The word here in Greek is plarahu, yeah. which means to diffuse. Yeah, it has a deeper meaning even. It is to fully preach and to expound upon. But the deeper meaning is it, it diffuses throughout your soul. Hallelujah. That, that Hallelujah. word there in the Greek. 
when we say a person fulfills their role as a doctor or a person fulfills their role as a dentist or I fulfill my role as a husband, it means you're doing it correctly. So Yeshua was saying, look, I didn't come to destroy the law and the prophets. In fact, everything he's just said pre this statement, everyone's going, oh, wow, they're all out of mind at this point. I play so, they're going missing. They're all going missing. And now he says, look, don't think I come to destroy any of the Lord of the prophets. I didn't come to destroy, but to fully preach, to diffuse in your soul, to magnify, to walk out in the fullness. For assuredly, I see to you till heaven and earth pass away. One jot and one tittle will by no means pass from the Lord till the Lord is fulfilled. After everything we've just read and seen all the cross references right throughout the Torah to Nach, now Yeshua saying this, you go, Oh, wow, no, he didn't come to, to do away with the law. He came to fully preach it. Then he says in verse 19, whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men to do so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever teaches and does shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. And we studied this out before, but the word I want to focus on is righteousness unless your righteousness excreves that of the scribes and the pharisees psalm 119 your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your lord is the truth are we is it making sense now after everything that we've just read we're dealing with the rabbi here the jewish rabbi of course he's quoting the torah tanakh he's the he's the rabbi he's a rabbi everything he's got to say has got to be torah tanakh he's the rabbi He's the master rabbi. He's the master rabbi. Righteousness is essentially doing what is right in a just way. It is doing the commandments of God in spirit and truth. Righteousness is keeping the law and the commandments. It's being made right with God. Of course, it's righteous and it's righteousness to have faith in Yeshua and believe he ascended. Of course, of course, of course it's righteous to believe on him who they pierced, that he is the atonement sacrifice, of course. But righteousness is applied and applicable when he, his spirit is in us and we walk out the commandments. In fact, Yeshua even tells us and confirms this in Mark 12, that the commandments is in accordance with righteousness because they come and say, Master, what is the greatest commandment? And what does he do? He says, love God and love your neighbor. And he quotes two Torah commandments. One's found in Leviticus 19. The other is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6. He didn't do away with the Torah. He preached the Torah. He preached it because he knew it was righteousness. Then he said, you're not too far away from the kingdom. You're not too far away from the kingdom for doing the commandments. Isn't that incredible? So at this point in chapter 5, I think it's good to mention the following. Yeshua doesn't add or take away. Many people think, oh, look, he gave us something new. It's renewed. We studied this out in the past. It's renewed. Like the moon in its cycle. It's not a, it's a new moon, but the, it's not a new moon. Like when, you, 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 when you, the cells on your body <coughs> regenerate and they're made new, you're not, you're not a new you. They just regenerated. It's renewed. This is what Yeshua did. He renewed it. He renewed it. When he says, I give you this new commandment in the Greek, it's renewed. In the Hebrew, that's what it is because it had already been given in Leviticus chapter 19. He was renewing it, reinstating it, magnifying it, transcending it to its proper originality of what it was meant to be, meant to be for us. And the way I look at this is this. This is how I see Yeshua refining, not redefining, refining the Torah. The Torah was given to us with Moses and it was a beautiful gem. But our heart, which is stony, had encapsulated that gem. And Yeshua comes and he refines that gem and he chips it away. He sanctifies us and he chip, 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 chips away at the stony heart. He chips away. And now Yeshua is on the scene in his ministry and he's polishing the Torah. He's showing us this is the gem when it's polished. This is what has been designed for you, Israel. Man had knotted himself up in all these knots. We tangled the word of God and the Torah up and we still have done it today. We've still done it. And Yeshua comes and he untangles the mess. That's what he did. He untangled the mess. Remember what he said. Don't think I have come to destroy. I have not come to destroy, but to fully preach. 
we're only 17 verses in. Every word that he said was plucked from the Torah to Nach, every word. And I wish that we could go through chapter 5, chapter 6 and chapter 7 to see every word that he said was plucked from the Torah to Nach. But we're only going to be able to do chapter 5 today. And every line deserves credit, every line deserves honour. But unfortunately, we're not going to have the time to do every line. So chapter five is going to be what we're going to focus on this week. Um, so with that, we will end part one of the Sermon on the Mount. Bless you, brother. Oh, bless, you, bless you, guys. Okay, Shabbat Shalom everyone, welcome back. Shabbat Shalom. Hallelujah. Uh, just to recap, um, we looked at the Sermon on the Mount, uh, Matthew chapter 5, the beginning of that. And we related uh, every word Yeshua said being taken um, from the Torah. And we seen where does inspiration come from. And then we revealed how Yeshua magnified the Torah, he magnified the Tanakh. And he fully preached it, as he said he was going to do. Look, I've come to fully preach it. So the reason why I set up that beginning um, with, with Rome and the whore is because we don't want to be deceived to this because they're actually lying to us that Messiah came and taught something else and gave us something new and nailed the Torah to the cross. That's what we're getting told. And that's what we're getting told. We're getting taught lawlessness from the lawless one. That's what he's called. I mean, that's the code name for the devil given by Paul. Shaul, the lawless one, the man, the son of the man of perdition. So we need to come away from that. And when we look line by line, precept by precept, we can see Yeshua fully preached it. So we're going to move forward now um, in our next part and just finish chapter uh, five, Matthew chapter five. So let us continue. 21 to 22 you have heard that it was said to those of old you shall not murder and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment but I say to you whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment and whoever says to his brother Racha shall be in danger of the council but whoever says you fool shall be in danger of hellfire that's serious you know, the Torah prescribes the death sentence of stoning your physical body for transgression. Yeshua is telling us that if you go around proclaiming someone is a fool or a ha, character assassination, mm. insults and abuse, you're liable to destruction of the soul. Yeah. I mean, come on. People are like, oh, I don't really like reading Leviticus and stuff like that because, oh, it's a bit harsh, isn't it? I'm like... What about when Yeshua says you're going to be liable to hellfire? Mm. What about that? Before we continue in the study, I want to make a note that Yeshua is saying here, you have heard it said. You have heard it said. And as I mentioned, the law was prescribed on a scroll. The stone tablets were in the Ark of the Covenant. They were written, prescribed by the finger of God. When Yeshua says, you have heard it said, he's rebuking them in the oral traditions of the Torah. They were took the words of Moses and taught it the way they wanted it to be and kept people in hard bondage and kept people enslaved by the Torah with man-made theologies, stigmas, and doctrines of demons as well. You know, the Talmud, the Talmud was an oral Torah that come out of Babylon that actually usurps Moses in the faith of Judaism. <clears throat> so Yeshua was rebuking the oral Torah. He was not rebuking the written scroll because he wrote it. <laughs> he wrote it. Why would he be rebuking his own word that he wrote, that he gave? Why? He's the same yesterday, today and forever. The Lord doth not change, Jacob, so you are not destroyed. So the scripture says, why would he be rebuking his own word? He wouldn't be doing that. He's rebuking them of old. You've heard it said. 
in the ancient times. Yeshua is not rebuking the law of God. So I think that that's important to mention before we go on any further. Now, Yeshua tells us that you shall not murder and whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. Now, we could all put our hands up and say, yeah, none of us have murdered. Everyone's hand would go up if I said, mm -hmm. uh, put your hand up if you haven't murdered anyone. Everyone's hand would shoot right up in the air. Yeshua says, put your hands down. Because if you've been angry with your brother in an unjust way without a cause, you've operated in the same spirit of murder. You are a murderer because you've been angry in an unjust way with your brother. That's really deep, isn't it? And that's super convicting and super piercing. It's the opposite it's of love your neighbour, isn't it, as yourself? It's the complete opposite, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Love your neighbour as yourself. It's contravening that, see, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Beautiful, brother. Notice how Yeshua uses man's justice system here, and he says, look, when we commit a crime, the final station is justice and then, you know, the penalisation or the consequence or the punishment for the crime that we've committed. But Yeshua actually takes that and says, well, what's the motive and the intent and where is the seed and the originality? And he, pre he prevents it by saying, look, this is in the heart that leads to this. So if we can, prevention is the best cure. So if we can prevent this, Hallelujah, and that's why he deals with the heart, because all of these things begin in the heart. They all begin in the heart, don't they? So what does he say here? He says, man's justice system deals with the end result of sin, the penalty of the crime, but I'm gonna deal with your heart where it all began, where it all began. So what is this racha? Because we don't wanna be in danger of the council. And what is this, you fool? Because we don't want to be in danger of hellfire. I was so convicted of this. And every time I read Sermon on the Mount, I'm pierced to heart by the double-edged sword, bone and marrow. We should all be caught up. When Peter proclaimed to the Jews, they were pierced to heart, pierced to heart. We're all guilty. We've all fell short of the glory of God. Racha in the Aramaic basically means worthless. It's like I spit on you, it's worthlessness. It's devoid, it's stupid, it's brainless. It's a numpty. And I was thinking, oh, wow, gosh. I mean, how often do we say racha to even the people that we love? You're stupid, stupid you. Mm. I was so convicted, I was so convicted. You're in danger of the council. And other translations is Sanhedrin, but beloved, this is not the Sanhedrin. This is the divine council that Yeshua is speaking about, because in the next verse, he tells us hellfire. Now, what is the divine council? The divine council is an angelic group of angels. And if we're going around spouting Lashon Hara about other people, you're liable to the council, the divine council. Things are going to happen in your life. That's what Tesserat was when you would break out in a leprosy. It was an angelic intervention. You're in danger of the council of angels. But when you say you fool, you're in danger of hellfire. Wow. What is this? We need to know. To say you, you fool Hebrew in Hebrew language was to say you are godless, basically. You're godless. And how often when we argue with even our beloved, we're like, yeah, well, you're not operating in the spirit and you're not doing what God says and you know, you're, you're not acting very godly now. That's like our number one weapon, isn't it? It's like our number one weapon to use against one another. Yeshua's proper rebuking us in this. He's saying, nah, you don't do that. That's the spirit of murder. Angry without a cause. What does it mean? Let's dig deeper. We need to know. It indicates someone who vainly prescribes the same spirit of murder to another and it describes a person so proud, so sensitive and so insecure that they get angry at the most trifling of things, the most unimportant of things. And they take no care of the consequence that that's having on another person. This person wears their feelings on their sleeves and is so easily offended. They then brood on the offense and nurse it into a grudge. This is what will manifest eventually as the anger that omits murder. So Yeshua's saying, nah, mate, he's saying nah. And he says that can bring you to the danger of hellfire. Now, what is this hellfire and what does it matter to us? Why did Yeshua say this? Yeshua wanted to show us that men are condemned for murder and truly murder is condemnable forever. It's completely wrong. The devil was a murderer in the beginning, remember? But Yeshua is telling us that long-lasting anger and insults, contemptuous speaking 
and careless, malicious talk which destroys a person's name and character can often be worse. The person who is a slave to the, this form just of anger, who speaks about contemptible things and treats people with contempt, as Tommy mentioned, does not love their neighbour as they love themselves. The fallen shores of the greatest commandment to love our neighbour as we love ourselves. Do unto others as you would have them do to you. And no one wants that for themselves. Nobody wants that. But what is this hellfire? And where did Yeshua get this from? Did he make this up? Was, is, this, is hell a New Testament concept? It comes from Gehenna. Now, for them that don't know, this is the Hinnom Valley. And the Hinnom Valley in the Tanakh is... Um, a place where child sacrifice used to take place. It was where Israel began the backsliding idolatry when they worshipped Molech, Remphan, Baals, these Canaanite deities, and they fell into gross idolatry and they ended up sacrificing their children, making them pass through the fire of Molech. Gehenna is then a cursed valley in the book of Jeremiah. It's a revolting, cursed, irradiated wasteland. So cursed that the Israelites used to dump all their rubbish there and burn it. And it was a place of eternal fire, basically, to them. It was a symbolic image of the lake of fire, which is the destruction of angels. Bear in mind, the people worship the fallen angels in this place. And this is why Yeshua says, the worm does not cease, the fire is not quenched. It was a permanent blaze, a refuge site to burn sewage, uh, carcasses, uh, excrements. It was just, it, that's, it, was the, it, was, it was basically the pit of earth and it would permanently be on fire and it would have a black veil of smog that engulfed it and it stunk. And you can research what the Hinnom Valley is and the curse of the Hinnom Valley, it's where we get the word Gehenna. So Yeshua is pointing to that, saying, you know, if we operate in this spirit of anger in an unjust way, we're liable to what the fallen angels have been doing. We need to turn away from all of that evil and iniquity and walk in righteousness. How convicting is that? That's serious, isn't it? He's saying, look, all them that do this against their brother, they're liable to a council of angels. For them that say godless, godless, you worthless person, you godless person, they're in danger of Gehenna, Gehenna, which obviously is related to the lake of fire where these fallen angels will be cast into and destroyed. This was a place of constant uncleanness. And Yeshua is convicting his followers. He's convicting his followers. They all knew what Gehenna was. The translation in the Greek, we get hell. Hades, the rendition, but we know that this is Gehenna. So he was quoting again the Torah Tanakh, saying, this is where people end up in this cursed valley. You know, and it's a symbolic picture of the lake of fire on earth. We don't want that. That's where the fallen angels are going. That's where the worm does not cease and the fire is not quenched. That's where there's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Oh, no thanks. He then goes on to show us what reconciliation looks like then. Matthew 5, 23 to 24. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. So he's showing us what the method is. What's the antidote? If we've done something wrong, we can't worship God correctly if we've offended our neighbour. We can't do it. The whole Bible is about forgiveness, reconciliation and restitution. That's the gospel message. So how can we love our God if we cannot love our neighbour, as the scriptures say? We, we have to love our neighbour in order to love our God correctly because our God is love. So he shows us the antidote. Retrace your steps before you worship God. Retrace your steps. Leave your gift at the altar. Your intent's good. You want to worship God. But God's saying, look, your sacrifice can be an abomination to me unless you reconcile the matter. This is super important because Israel are a stiff-necked people, you know. We are a stiff-necked people. It can be our superpower. You'll never put a pork butty in my mouth, ever. I'll check the ingredients of me toothpaste for the rest of my life. But we can be a stiff-necked people when it comes to contentions as well. And we have to retrace our steps. And you'll know it. You'll be in a deficit. The Bible says the wicked are tormented by their own flesh. The wicked are tormented by their own flesh. That's horrendous. And when we have contentions going on, we're tormented. We have to go back before we can worship God, reconcile the matter, leave our gift at the altar. And it's, this is the hardest thing to do. I'm telling you now, it's easy to put ZTs on. It's easy, it's hard to go to your neighbour with your tail between your legs and say, 
look, forgive me, look, what's going on? Can we please reconcile this? I'm sorry. And once it's done, it's the most liberating thing ever. You're just so liberated by it. You're like, why didn't I do that sooner? What got over me? Like, you know, first be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. Paul tells us, do not let the sun go down with your anger. Do not let it happen because it, it cultivates this spirit of murder. It cultivates it. And Yeshua is saying, this is not kingdom activity. This is not kingdom activity. When Yeshua quoted this then, leave your gift at the altar, go back, first be reconciled, then come and offer your gift. What was he going on about? He was obviously going on about the book of Leviticus. We were taught about the altar and we're taught about the trespass offering and we're taught about the reconciliation uh, means of how we reconcile a situation. Leviticus 6, 1 to 6, and the Lord spoke to Moses saying, if a person sins and commits a trespass against the Lord, by lying to his neighbor, what was delivered to him for safekeeping or a pledge or a robbery or as he has extorted his neighbor? So look, if you sin against your neighbor, look what it says, you've sinned against God. If a person trespasses against the Lord, by what? By offending their neighbor, by doing something wrong to their neighbor. That's you sinned against God. David said, alone to you, O Lord, have I sinned. My sin is ever before you. To you and you alone have I sinned, O God. You see, this is why God doesn't want to accept our offer until we're first reconciled, because actually we've sinned against him. And he shall bring his trespass offering to the Lord, a ram without blemish from the flock with your valuation as a trespass offering to the priest, to what? To make atonement for him. Powerful, powerful. Yeshua is quoting Leviticus here. He's quoting the Tanakh. Do we see it? He's telling us, look, you can't bring your trespass offering to worship the Lord correctly unless you are fully reconciled. Tanakh quotations, again, mend the broken relationship with your neighbor first and foremost. Why? Proverbs 21, 27, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination. How much more when he bring it with a wicked mind? Wow. It's an abomination. So if the mind is not right consciously, how much worse is that offering towards God going to be? It's wicked. He doesn't want it. He doesn't want it. We have to reconcile ourselves first. Proverbs 15, verse 8, the sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. So once we've reconciled, then our gift of the upright is a delight to him. This is what it's all about, beloved. Elsewhere in Isaiah 66, the Lord says he despises offerings brought with the wrong attitude. He states that those who come to his altar in error are likened to them who have done detestable things. He who kills a bull is as if he has slain a man. He who sacrifices a lamb is as if he has broken a dog's neck. He who offers a grain offering he is offered swine's blood. He who burns incense as if he blesses an idol, just as they have chosen their own way and their soul delights in their abominations. What's this trying to say? God's saying, if you kill an ox as a sacrifice to try and worship me, but your heart is, is crooked, you have killed a man. If you try and sacrifice that lamb to atone for yourself, but your heart is crooked, you've, you've broken a dog's neck. If you come with your grain offering and your incense, you might as well be burning it to an idol. I don't want it. I don't want it. That's what the Lord's saying. We can't get the sacrificial system wrong. You know, this is what's going on now. Oh, well, I just sin and uh, yeah, well, that's it. Just say 10 Hail Marys and it's boxed off. No, no way. The Lord doesn't want it. He wants the broken heart and the contrite spirit. This is the most acceptable offering to him. These things are designed to show us that we are wretches and we need a savior. And therefore, when we've reconciled that we are crooked, we also need to reconcile it with others. Ephesians, uh, Ecclesiastes 5 verse 1. Walk prudently when you go to the house of God and draw near to here rather than to give the sacrifice of fools for they do not know that they do evil. Yeshua says, leave your gift at the altar, return, retrace your steps, fix things in the world with your neighbor, then you're going to be able to worship me correctly. Amen. Amen. Yeshua said, you have heard it said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in her heart. We could say, hands up, who hasn't committed adultery, everyone's hand goes up. Everyone's hand goes up. You soon come back down when Yeshua says, what about that time your eye wandered here? What about when you thought about that? What about when that imagination told you this? Your hands go back down. 
Yeshua did not make this any easier. He took the Torah, he magnified it and transcended it. Everyone could say, yeah, I haven't committed adultery. He said, what about your eyes? He says, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it far from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members shall perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. When Yeshua said this, guard your eyes out through lustful activity. Where did he get that from? He got that from the Tanakh. It was Samson. Samson lusted after Delilah and he lost his eyes from the Philistines through his lust. When Yeshua said these things, he wasn't making them up. He was constantly quoting the Tanakh. Every first century Israelite's going, I wonder an eye and lust. Samson lost his eyes. He lost his power. The Spirit of God departed from him. Whoa. They knew this. They, they lived on the Torah Tanakh. That's what they lived on. They knew it inside out. And we come along a couple of thousand years later and we're like, oh, that sounds a bit strange. Pluck your eyes out and cut your hand off. What's all this about? They knew. We should know this Israel. would we go around this mountain enough to know what he's starting to say to us now. This is the rabbi, the Jewish rabbi. He's quoting the Tanakh every single time. He's a Jew. He's the Jewish rabbi. They lived on this stuff. They knew it when they were like 11. They could quote it word for word without looking at the scroll. This is what the lustful eye lands you in, beloved. The parting of the Spirit of God bound up in chains and you lose your eyes. Better to pluck your eyes out than to go down that path, you get me? Yeshua says, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off for it's more profitable for you that one of your members shall perish than for all your whole body to be cast into hell. Again, whilst this is about, look, if your eyes causing you to sin, make yourself blind, he doesn't literally mean go and take your eyes out, all right? We know that. So don't be t t attempting no surgery with the cocktail sticks there. <laughs> serious, serious, I'm not taking liability for that. When he says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off, what's he saying? Of course, it's Hebrew idiomatic language for literally stop yourself at all costs. Paul says you haven't yet resisted sin unto blood. You know, it's like whatever's causing you the problem, you know, take it out the game. Just get rid of it. You know what I mean? At all costs. Yeah, that's what he's saying. But again, where's this from? Where's this idea of cutting your hand off if it's caused you to sin? It's in the Tanakh. It's in the Torah. Deuteronomy 25 verse 12, if two men fight together and the wife of one draws near to rescue her husband from the one attacking him and puts out her hand and seizes him by the genitals, then she shall cut, then you shall cut off her hand and your eyes shall not pity her. That's where it's from. This is what he's quoting. And you can look at that and go, oh, that sounds a bit harsh, but you know, you can do a whole study in this. You can do a whole study in this. I'll just summarize it. Jack last week brought how men who were castrated couldn't go into the temple. This whole covenant is about the seed of Abraham. It was through his seed and his loins that the promise and the Messiah would come through. So if a woman goes for someone's loins there, I mean, if I was fighting with a guy and Becca went for some fella's loins, I'd be like, yo, whoa, whoa, whoa. come in, mate. Like, you know, go for the chin or that. Why are you going for them things, man? Sorry, Beck. But what, what's Yeshua saying then? What, 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 what's Yeshua using here? He's saying, look, if your hand is causing you to defile the covenant of Abraham and to break covenant with God and to nullify the seed of promise, cut it off. Be like the bride who will take off her own arm so she isn't sinning. That, this is what he's saying. Otherwise, what does this mean? This is what he's, this is the meat of the scripture. He's the rabbi. When he said, pluck your eyes out if you're lusting, Samson. When he said, cut your hand off if it's causing you to sin, it's the woman who grabs the genitals. And he's saying, look, if your hand is causing you to be that woman that goes round to break and nullify and crush the lineage of promise and to crush the covenant of Abraham, get your hand off you. Don't be breaking the covenant of Abraham. This is what he's teaching us. Yeshua then goes on to say, Matthew 5, 38, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. Yeshua was not having a go at the, the written Torah that's perfect here. 
he was having a go at how man were interpreting this. Well, if you take my eye out, I'm going to take your eye out. When this is to do with restorative justice, it's to do with restorative justice. We know Yeshua preached an eye for an eye because he said, with what measure you use, it will be used against you. Judge not, least ye be judged. With what measure you use, it will be used against you. He did teach eye for eye in restorative purposes. He even said, if... You go round with your eye and you've got a splinter in your eye and you're saying to your brother, remove that splinter from your eye, but you've got a plank in your own eye. He's, t he's teaching us, look, we're going to apply restorative justice. We need to be blameless ourselves. He taught an eye for an eye. He's teaching against them who were saying, well, you slapped me on one side, so I've got to slap you on one. That's what the Torah of God says. That's how I'm reconciled now. And that's how we, we're right now. That's what he was having a go at. Now, this is so much more deeper. And that's why he says, I tell you not to resist an evil person. It's like, look, if they're going to be evil, you know, you can resist that. You're not going to be a punch bag and a victim. You get me? You can resist that. But whoever slaps you on one side, turn to them the other as well. And where did he get this from? Lamentations, chapter 3, 27 to 30. It is good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone and keep silent because God has laid it upon him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There may yet be hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes him. Let him be full of reproach. Yeshua is saying, bear of reproach. That's the better way to do this. God will bring vengeance. He says, vengeance is mine, thus saith the Lord. Yeshua is saying, don't be a pure victim to evil, but rather bear the yoke for the greater good of God and his kingdom. He's teaching lamentations. It's good for a man to bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone because God has laid it upon him. Let him, let him be reconciled with God on the matter. Let him deal with God on the matter. Let him turn to the, the cheek, the one who strikes him. You know, how often are we doing this? How often are we turning the cheek? This isn't about like, oh, I've been waiting my whole life to practice this. I've just been waiting for someone to come up and slap me so I can just show them the other side. <laughs> what about when someone says, oh, you're this, and you go, well, you're that. You haven't turned the cheek there, have you? You haven't turned the cheek there, no way. What about when someone does something to you and you think, I'll get them back for that. <laughs> <laughs> In where? <laughs> He's the worst for it. <laughs> We've got to turn the other cheek. We've got to turn the other cheek. It's, it's the greater way. It's the greater way. It's the greater restorative justice. Let the divine counsel sort this out. Let, let the Lord get vengeance. Matthew 5, verse 40, Sermon on the Mount. Let's keep going. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your coat, let him have your cloak also. Now, this word sue in the King James, um, in the Greek, it can be condemn. So if anyone wants to condemn you and take away your coat, let them have your cloak also. Krino. Krino is in the Greek, yeah. yeah. It's a judge, there, isn't it? But it can be to judge favourably or unfavourably. Mm hmm so you judge unfavorably, you're practically being condemned, as you said, yeah. 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 Clean over is in the Greek. So, who was condemned for their coat in the scripture? Joseph. That's right. And who was Potiphar. condemned for his cloak? Joseph. Potiphar, yeah, yeah. So Joseph was condemned for his coat by his brothers. He was condemned to the pit, and he was also condemned to jail for his cloak. Remember, he left his cloak with Potiphar. When Yeshua was saying these things, all the Israelites are going, Pum, that's Joseph, who was condemned for his cloak and his coat. And he's saying, be like Joseph. I shall never sin against my God. This is where he's getting it from. Oh, yeah. This is where he's getting it from. Matthew 5, 42, give to him who asks and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Again, where's he getting it from? Deuteronomy 15, 7 to 8. If there is among you a poor person of your brethren within your gates, in your land, which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide and willingly borrow what is sufficient for his needs. This is where he's getting it from. He's quoting the Torah. It says, the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So you've been given, everything you possess has been given to you by God. So if you've been given that by God, what are you given to others? What are you given to others? Proverbs 21, 26, the righteous give and do not spare. Psalm 37, 21, the wicked borrow and do not repay, but the righteous show mercy and give. Yeshua then goes on to say, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Again, I just want to clarify, nowhere in the Torah does it say to hate your enemy. 
It doesn't say that. It doesn't say love God and hate love your neighbour and hate your enemy. It does not say that. You will not find that anywhere in the Torah. Yeshua is rebuking man's oral tradition again. Yeah, we hate the Philistines. Yeah, we hate the Amalekites. Of course, we can have righteous anger towards sin and we can hate with perfect hatred, sin. But Yeshua is saying, you have heard it said, you shall love your enemy and uh, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. Well, it doesn't say to hate your enemy anywhere in the Torah. Again, he's rebuking the oral traditions of man. But I say to you, Love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. And look, for anyone watching online, want a bit of homework. Tommy's been setting homework every week. This is for your own studies, by the way, so check that one out. <laughs> uh, check this out yourself. You know, who was spitefully used and persecuted but prayed? Prayed for that person. Who was hated but did good? Who? Uh, Blessed instead of cursed. Go and check it out because it's all there. It's all there. It's all there. And he says that you may be sons of your father in heaven for he makes his son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. Well, he's just quoted uh, Psalms there that says the Lord is gracious and compassionate on all that he has made. Slow to anger, rich and abounding in love. On all that he has made. He makes the sun shine on the righteous and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not tax collectors do also. Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your heavenly Father is perfect. That's Leviticus 19 language. We've just read it in the previous weeks. Be therefore holy, as I, your heavenly Father, am holy. He's just quoting the Torah Tanakh. Mm -hmm. But this should be really convicting because it's dead easy to love each other here. For if you love only those who love you, what reward have you? What reward have you? If you only love them who love you, what reward have you? What reward have you? If you only have the capacity to love someone who loves you, what reward have you? What reward? We all want reward. We want treasures in heaven. What reward do you have if you only love them that love you? Do not even tax collectors do the same. Do not people in the world do the same. Do not strippers and strip clubs love their own family. Do not governments and, and bankers who are corrupt do they not love th themselves and, and, and the, the, the banking institutes and the mates? What about gangsters? Gangsters love one another. He's saying, look, do the people in the world not do the same? What reward? What reward do we want? We want the treasures in heaven. We want to be perfect. He says, therefore, you shall be perfect just as your heavenly father is perfect. So I'll put a quote there from Rabbi Yeshua. Do not think I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. No chance, no chance. We've just got going, chapter five, that. That's just chapter five. There's chapter six and chapter seven, where he just wellies the Torah all around the park. And we're gonna get into it, not today, of course, but he told us from the get-go, do not think I have come to destroy the law and the prophets. How can we have the audacity to believe otherwise that he came, nailed it to a tree, that it's a curse, that it's unjust, that it's a burden, that we can't do it, that it's not for us. How can we say that anymore after seeing that? When he stated clearly and plainly, do not think I've come to destroy the Lord and the prophets. No way, I came to fully preach them. I came to preach them so in such a way that you're gonna be ex placio, you're gonna be out of mind. You're gonna get blew away. Remember, he taught the law not as their teachers of the law. Mm not as their teachers of the law. So to end, the Sermon on the Mount is truly a Torah masterclass. It's a masterpiece by Yeshua, by a rabbi who knew the Torah inside out. And he quoted the Torah. He taught it as one with regal authority, like one wearing a crown. So just to end, Matthew 23, verse two. I mean, it doesn't get, listen to this. I mean, this is from Yeshua, this is it. Those who sit in Moses' seat do what they say, but do not do as they do. He tells us, 
those who sit in Moses' seat. So what was Moses' seat? That was in a synagogue, that those who were reading from the scroll would sit in Moses' seat and they would read aloud from the scroll. And he's saying, look, them who read aloud from the scroll in the synagogues, them who sit in Moses' seat, do as they say, but don't do as they do, because they're reading from the scroll and they honor me with their lips, but their works and their deeds are far from me. That's what he's saying. They neglect the weightier matters of the Torah. Luke 24, 27, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures concerning himself. <laughs> and beginning with Moses and the prophets, what did he do? He expounded to them in all the scriptures, not just a few pages here and there going, look, look, that's me. All the scriptures, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, all of them, all of them. He expounded in all the scriptures, all the things concerning himself. John 5, 46 to 47. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? And with that, beloved, we will end. Bless you, Joseph. Bless you, brother. Bless you, brother. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father, Lord God Almighty, we bless you, Lord. We thank you, Father, for Yeshua. We love Yeshua. Yeshua, Jesus Christ. The Mashiach is the King. The King, the conqueror Lion of Judah. We proclaim our allegiance to one King today. The King of the Jews, Yeshua, who died and paid the price so that we may be free in Him, that we may live in liberty and be ransomed, that we may return to the covenant and the wedding vows and be that most beloved bride that you so desire. We love you. We love you, Lord. We thank you for Yeshua, the Lamb, the Mashiach. We love you, Father, and we thank you for your Son, your only beloved begotten Son, Yeshua. We thank you, Father. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Thank you.